All right, so we're going to um, talk about the quiz first, and then, as usual, and then we'll um, we'll review and go through the the quiz itself and talk about elimination reactions um, in in a little bit more detail. Um, and then we're going to spend most of the today talking about um, talking about the how we determine what the dominant mechanism is going to be. Um, we've got a, a fair number of, um, of different choices, well, four choices right now, right? We've got SN1, SN2, E1, and E2. And depending on the conditions we can, and what the base or nucleophile is and what the leaving group is, we can favor one of those mechanisms over the other three. And that's gonna determine what our major product is going to be um, and so that's what we're going to spend most of today going through. A um, couple good random um, OCHEM questions. Um, the que question about artificial sweeteners and zero calorie sweeteners. Um, there are a lot of them that um, that are so they're all called sugar free sweeteners. Most of them are pretty pretty close to zero um calories if you sweeten to the same level that you would with sugar um and there are a couple answers as to how that happens um one of which is that the binding sites for our for our enzymes and especially for a process that's important to our bodies as carbohydrate metabolism our binding sites are pretty specific um and they don't mutate much at all because if you had a a mutation in your in the metabolism that was responsible for breaking down glucose, for instance, um, that would almost certainly cause cause your organism to die to not be able to digest glucose properly. And if you can't d digest glucose properly, um, then you're basically going to die. There's very there are a few bacteria that that live on on energy sources, a few fungi too that live on energy sources besides. Um, glucose, but basically everything that lives needs to be able to break down glucose or it doesn't live. Um, so those tend to be really highly conserved um, and very, very specific enzymes. Um, but the, the enzymes and the receptor sites that are responsible for taste are not nearly as, as crucial to survival, right? They're helpful for survival. It's an advantage to be able to taste something and know if it's sweet or salty or poisonous. Um, but it's not nearly as crucial. And so as a result, the binding sites on your, on your tongue and in your nose tend to be a lot less specific. And so they're easier to fool um, than, than the enzymes that actually break down the sugars. Um, that's not to say that your body can't completely, can't digest some of the artificial sweeteners or some of the sugar-free alternatives. Um, the other reason that you you they're called uh, low calorie or zero calorie sweeteners is because they're they tend to be really 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 sweet compared to sugar. Um, I think saccharin is something like 500 times sweeter than sugar by volume. So if you put a teaspoon of saccharin in coffee, it would taste like you put 500 grams of co of of um, sugar in your coffee. So basically your body can break down a lot of these artificial sweeteners and provide some amount of energy from them, but it's just such a small amount if you're sweetening to your normal taste buds that you can essentially say that it's zero calories or close to zero calories. Like Diet Coke, you know, classic, always billed as having zero calories. If you actually looked at what happens when you digest, if you drank two liters of Diet Coke, you would actually get about five, 10 calories out of that. Um, we just call it zero calories because of sig figs, basically, um, because if you're drinking a reasonable amount of it, the amount of, of it's not saccharin that's in Diet Coke, it's uh, aspartame, which is the same thing. Um, I mean, not the same compound, but just as sweet. Um, so it winds up being close to zero calories just because you don't need very much of it. Um, then there was another random question about um somebody was looking at the at the um compound chemistry um poster 
infographic about uh, whiskey flavors um, and asked about how do you get the specific flavor of whiskey that you that you want? How do you get that lactone or that ester um, or that wood alcohol and trace amounts to, to be dissolved in, in your whiskey or whatever your alcohol is? Um, and the answer is that they don't do it synthetically. You don't add just one compound at a time. Um, you don't, so what you do instead is you just, you pick the wood that contains the flavors that you want to put in your whiskey and you age your whiskey in barrel made of that wood or with shavings made out of that wood. Um, so that's, it's uh, more about figuring out what makes oak aged whiskey taste different than peach wood than whiskey that's aged in peach wood. It's more about analyzing what's in those two and seeing what makes it taste different rather than how do I take that compound and add it? Although you do see that in some of the more strongly or specifically flavored liquors like Fireball or you know vanilla vodka, things like that. Um, gin is another good example. Gin is made is just vodka that they add um, specific botanical compounds to to give it specific flavors. Um, a lot of times just by using essential oils. Um, so that you do see some of that, um, but usually if it's something like whiskey that's that complex, it's got that many random things going on, it's just because you picked the right wood. Um, and so there's, there's still not a better way to get very subtle flavors and trace amounts of compounds into, um, into a product than using natural sources for the most part. And then a few things that are getting a little bit more closely related to, to where we are in biochem and um, the COVID vaccine. Um, I think it'd be possible to get to a point where enzymes are the most common types of catalysts used in chemical reactions. Um, and if so, do you think we'll harvest enzymes from living things or synthesize them? For the second part, that's actually a lot easier to answer. Um, we'll definitely harvest them it's way easier. If you're making something that's more than a couple amino acids long, it's way easier um, to genetically modify yeast or E. coli to produce that protein and then harvest it from that genetically modified yeast than it is to actually make it by hand. You can do that. You can make a custom enzyme by just adding, by doing a sequence of reactions um, in a way that puts the amino acids in the right order. Um, but then you, it winds up being really long. A lot of proteins are hundreds or thousands of amino acids long. Um, so usually it's more convenient to um, genetically modify easy, they call them um, model organisms, organisms that we understand how to grow them really well, um, organisms that uh, their genome has been sequenced really well. Um, and so, Yeast and E. coli are the two most common. That's actually how we produce all of the insulin um, that is that is used is um, somebody genetically modified yeast cells to produce human insulin. Um, yeast is a single celled organism. There's no reason that yeast would need insulin um, because insulin is used to communicate from one part of the body to another part of the body. So they just made yeast that produced a human enzyme and then um, they just um, harvest it uh, and so they, they actually refer to that as bioprocess engineering. Um, it's an entire field. You can have process engineering usually refers to designing like a factory of some sort. And so you can have mechanical process engineering where that'd be like designing a, a car factory um, where you're building mechanical products. Um, chemical process engineering is things like designing, um, designing refineries or designing chemical plants that produce pharmaceuticals. And then bioprocess engineering is using biological systems to produce certain products that you want, um, which was not what I thought it was when I first, that was the very first class I took in grad school. And I had no idea how different chemical engineering was from chemistry at that point. So I said, oh, bioprocess engineering, that's going to be like about genetic modification and stuff. And no, I was, my final project was to design a factory and you have to do things like plan out where your where your electrical sources are coming in and plan out where your waste is going and communicate with the with the city about where what the whether the waste is harmful or not or treat your waste and um, it was not what I was expecting at all though it was a really cool class. 
Um, dietary fiber is another good question. Um, and I think this one's really interesting because basically only this is similar to the artificial sweeteners question um, in that basic it's um, human metabolism, especially, but basic anything that's an invertebrate or that is, um, sorry, larger than a single cell, anything that's a eukaryote essentially um, cannot really break down cellulose. Cellulose is, all it is, is a polymer, a bunch of glucose molecules linked together, but it's linked together in a way that the enzymes that are present in our body can't break it down into the individual glucose pieces. So our bodies can take starches and glycogen, which are the same thing. They're just polymers made of glucose, um, but they're linked at a different carbon. And that difference is, is all that it takes for our bodies to not be able to break it down. Like I said, those enzymes are very specific. Um, and so cellulose, our body can't break down at all. Um, and so that's what dietary fiber is. It's just stuff that goes through our body that we can't do anything with. Um, and even animals that do get their, their calories from cellulose, they don't do it directly. Um, so ruminants are animals or mammals that have multiple stomachs. Um, and so like cows, goats, sheep, there's more I'm sure that I'm missing. Um, Probably some some ungulates like antelope are, would fit into that category as well. I would I would wager deer maybe I don't know, um, but with the those multiple stomachs, one of the first of which is actually just to break down the cell walls made of the cellulose, just physic by physically mashing them, and then the second stomach actually just has bacteria in it, and that bacteria is able to break down cellulose and turn it into smaller chunks that are actually digestible. Um, and so the bacteria actually get the majority of the calories from the, from the grass that a cow eats. And then the, when it passes to the third stomach, that's when the cow, it's been broken into small enough pieces that the cow can, cow's enzymes can actually finish the job and turn that into energy. Um, and so pretty much anything that actually lives on cellulose, so pandas, koalas, um, termites, um, they all have a similar system where they have some gut bacteria that actually does the breaking down of the, of the cellulose and then they just get what's left over after the bacteria um, are done with it. Um, and so it's, it's basically because humans are multi-celled organisms are so kind of locked in your ways because it would take a pretty big shift to be able to go from being using starches and sugars as your primary energy source to using cellulose directly. And so it, that would be such a big shift to be super unlikely we would ever see a mutation like that in a multi-celled organism. Um, however, it can happen at the bacterial level. So barring something like a small form of life, like you know maybe some you know, paramecium or um, diatom or something like that had some similar event to when mitochondria were first introduced and incorporated. Um, you guys understand, have you guys uh, heard about the history of mitochondria at all and chloroplasts for that matter? They're basically, the, the theory is that they were introduced, they were basically was two different life forms and then a cell basically swallowed a mitochondria and then incorporated that into its own cellular structure in the future. Um, and so if there was something like that, where a diatom or some small form of life was able to envelop one of those bacteria that can break down cellulose, then potentially that'd be a whole nother branch on the tree of life that would, could go a totally different direction, um, but be very, very unlikely to ever see that at the, at the macroscopic level um, without some tampering makes it sound like it's a bad thing, but without some alteration to genome and theory you could add a gene like that to a, a small form of life, a type of fungus, for instance, or something like that. Um, and that, that could then be used to sort of harvest energy from cellulose in a more efficient way than using bacteria. Um, but it would probably take some, some help from humans or some, some organism that could do um, genetic modifications. Um, I like the fact that you guys are all asking questions that are almost, at least to me, they seem related, um, talking about the different enzymes and how the molecular shape fits in. 
um, because it means I get to talk about all of them at once instead of having to save some of them. Um, last was what concepts were toughest for me when I took OCHEM. OCHEM 1 was the toughest, um, was, I wouldn't say it's the hardest class I took, but it was the class that I struggled with the most. I'm, yeah, I was lucky enough to have a good background in math when I got to college and for Gen Chem just kind of made sense to me in a lot of ways. I had a really good chem teacher in high school. So Gen Chem was kind of easy. Um, at least I thought it was. When I got to OCHEM, it was very, very different as you guys are experiencing. And OCHEM 1 um, was, I think that that's when I got the lowest grade on a test I ever got in, in undergrad, um, at least in a chemistry class. And it was dealing with the stuff you guys are doing right now. I remember feeling when I was trying to write mechanisms or decide what mechanism was favored, I felt like I was just making stuff up. Um, yeah, that's, I remember feeling that way and I'm sure you guys are feeling that way too. That and especially when it comes to the specific stereoisomers, cis versus trans and R versus S that we would get. The other thing was, the other thing you're struggling with in lab, which is how do you read spectra and interpret it? Um, there's systematic ways to go about that, but it feels there's so many possibilities at first. It feels like you're just making stuff up, um, which I really didn't like after Gen Chem where I could always get a numerical answer. Um, even if it was wrong, I could get through a problem and at the end feel like, hey, I, I understood what I was doing in that. It does not feel like that for a lot of the interpreting spectra. So um, remember I was in your shoes longer than I would like to admit ago, but I remember it. All right, let's talk about the quiz questions specifically. Um, most of you guys did fine on the naming. I don't know why I didn't put the parentheses around the, R, the E and the Z like I did in class in the key because everybody got marked down for it even though you pretty much all did it correctly. Um, so I'm, unless you guys have specific questions about naming things, um, I don't think we need to spend too much time here I think the only consistent mistake I saw um, was not recognizing that there could be E and Z. There were a few people that didn't catch that there could be an E versus a Z. Um, but other than that, you guys are pretty good at these rules by this point, I think. And pretty much everybody got R versus S right. So good work on that. This one gave people a little bit of trouble. Some, some of you had trouble finding the fourth product. Um, you guys pretty much all were able to draw the molecule correctly, which is gonna look, so, and if you're not sure about how to. Sean? Yeah. Do you mean to be screen sharing right now? Yes, I do. Um, so when it comes to drawing these, these, uh, molecules, um, the way I would generally approach these, if I'm given an R versus an S, it's a little bit hard to see off the top of your head, whether you're going to draw R versus S. My approach to doing these is usually just draw one and then figure out if you drew the R version or the S version, draw the, draw it with your lowest priority already in back into the board because that's the easiest to do your priority and then figure out if that was R or S. And if you got the wrong one, then you just switch two of the substituents. So if I was drawing this, I would start by just drawing the pentane, ideally a little bit more neat than that. Um, three bromo, two, three dimethyl. So there's a methyl and then our lowest priority is going to be the methyl that's attached here. So I'll put that in the back, put the bromine forward. So that's going to give us, so if we, if we check the priority here, number one goes to the bromine, then to the isopropyl group, then to the ethyl, so we did already draw it in the R configuration. If we wanted the S, 
configuration. Now that you guys are strong enough on this, I can tell you the shortcut. If you want to switch from R to S, you switch any two of the substituents, not three, only two of the substituents. So to go from R to S, if I wanted to be, draw the S, I would just switch the methyl and the bromine and leave the others where it is. And that's going to switch which direction my lowest priority is pointing, right? Now my lowest priority is pointing out instead of in, which means I have to look at it from the other side, which is going to switch everything around to the other direction. So that's a, a, a good trick when it comes to if you're given a specific stereoisomer to draw and you draw the wrong one on your first try, switch any two of the things you drew. You can also leave the bromine in the methyl and switch the isopropyl in the ethyl. And that would have the same effect of switching where two and three are. And so your draw, your arrow would be going the other direction. So if we want to, so this is a, the right stereoisomer. I'm sorry, can you clarify really quickly? Mm -hmm. You're saying we can only switch two of the priority groups around, but then if we look at it from the other direction, aren't we switching all four? So, I, I, yes, more or less. Um, if, I, if I just switch, the, if I put the methyl coming towards us and the bromine going away from us, if we go through the same process of figuring out what's our, we have bromine as our highest priority, then our isopropyl, then our ethyl, which, and then we could take that and we could spin it like a fan blade, like we've done before. If we kept the isopropyl in, one, in the right same spot and then switched it, so then the bromine would be up and to the right, the ethyl would be coming out towards us and the methyl would be going back. If you actually go through that whole process, um, then you'll find we got the opposite stereoisomer. What I meant by stepping through and looking at it from the other side was our normal ways. If you have your lowest priority already pointing out, rather than doing the fan blade rotation for some of you guys it was easier to think about stepping through the mirror and looking out um and you and you know if you look at if you look at um you know a bumper sticker that's on a windshield from the inside all the letters are backwards right if you look at it from the opposite side all of your stereo chemistry your mirror images are flipped so if you have one one or sorry that'd be four one two three we would normally think okay that's one to two to three that's r but i have to look at it from the opposite direction which means clockwise would switch to counterclockwise but yes to redraw that from the other side i would ne then need to switch everything switch all four of them which you can kind of think about is switching from r to s and then back from s to r you switch two of them and then you switch the other two. You flipped it twice if you do that. Which now we're getting into the part where I'm just confusing you. And when you had a good grasp on this, which is where I didn't want to be. So if you're if you were following what I was saying at the beginning, that's fine. Just do it the way you did it because everybody got this drawn correctly, I think. Um, and don't pay too much attention to to that. And the main, that wasn't even the main part of this problem anyway, right? The main part of this problem was um, drawing the four different alkenes you could make. And so if we want to identify what the four different beta carbons are, the four different beta carbons we have is we've got a beta carbon here. We've got a beta carbon here. And then we have a, this is the one of the first examples we've seen where we have three distinct beta carbons. Those will all give us different products, right? If we do an elimination towards the, and I'll try and color code these. If I do an elimination um, with one of the red, or with the hydrogen that's on the red beta carbon, 
I'm going to wind up with our double bond is going to be between carbons two and three. And on carbon three, we still have a methyl. And then we have an ethyl on the other side. So we'll wind up with that product. And the thing that I think a lot of you struggled with was you guys were able to do that pretty well. And where you struggled was realizing there was an E versus a Z isomer. That was the fourth one that some of you struggled to find was one of the beta carbons will give you an E, e and a Z product. It's not this one because on one side of our alkene, we have two methyl groups that are identical, right? So this one is fine. There's only one stereoisomer. If we look at the blue, if we put the double bond between carbons three and four, we get that product, if just draw it the way it's convenient first. And is there an E or Z version here? This is the one that has the E and the Z, right? Because each of the carbons in the alkene group have two different things attached. So it doesn't matter which side you flip, you just have to flip one of them to get the other stereoisomer. So I usually just keep whatever the biggest side is the same whatever is the more complicated side, keep that the same and flip the other side because that's usually easier to see what's what's happening. And then last but not least, if we do the green beta carbon, we get this product, which does not have an E or a Z. Correct, because you have two different things on the top carbon, but then the bottom carbon has two hydrogens on it. And you can switch those two hydrogens and get the same molecule. So Sean, yeah. for the, um, the beta carbon, the methyl group next to bromine coming off of that same carbon, um, when we're drawing our products, I, I know I asked you this in um, your office hours, but I'm still just kind of confused when I would need to show whether that's now like a wedge or if that's pointing away from us and what the deal is with that. So when you, if you want to show the, the transition state or draw the structure in a way that's going to tell you whether you're going to be stereo specific, that only, we only need to worry about that if there two things have to be true. You have to only have a single hydrogen that can be removed um, on the beta carbon, and you have to be able to make two different stereoisomers. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. So for there's only one hydrogen on the red carbon, but because there are two methyl groups attached, it doesn't matter which is pointed each way because it, that's not, we're not gonna have two different possibilities for the stereoisomer, right? So if I drew that out, if I drew the active side out for the red carbon, it would look like, um, so carbon, if this is our, let me make sure I get the right, And I'm going to kind of rotate everything so I can draw the bromine flat here. So what that means up here, we're going to have coming out towards us would be the ethyl. And going away would be the methyl. And then on this side, it's going to, it's going to be in that staggered configuration preferentially, right? So that you don't wind up with, um, with that that steric interaction, that torsional strain. Um, so we're going to have the, we need the hydrogen to be in the same plane, so flat relative to the rest of the molecule here. And then you're going to have two methyls, one going into the board, one coming out of the board. 
So when we when we actually draw the mechanism, we'd have the bromine leaving. We have these electrons moving over to make the pi bond, and then we have our base grabbing the hydrogen. When all of that happens and we flatten this molecule out, it basically it has to be in this shape. It, you have to have the hydrogen 180 degrees from the bromine because they have to be flat, but they also have to be pointed in other opposite directions. So if you only have one hydrogen on the beta carbon, you can only get one product. It just doesn't matter when it came to drawing it for this one. We didn't need to get here because these two things are identical. If we could tell the difference between these two, then we're going to get, there would be two possible stereoisomers we could draw, but only one of them would happen. The fact that these two are identical means there's only one stereoisomer we could draw anyway. So we didn't need to go through this. So those are the, you need both of those criteria for you to really worry about it. You need there to only be one possible hydrogen or, and you need to be able to tell the difference. There needs to be an E possibility and a Z possibility. If you don't have both of those possibilities, you just draw your alkene. Because if we, and we can see that on the blue one. If we look at the blue possibilities, there are two possibilities here, E and Z, and we want to know which one of them is favored. We're going to make both of them in this case. Um, but because there are two possible hydrogens that can be removed, we're going to get both of them. And if all we want to do is see which one is favored, then we just look at which one puts the biggest groups away from each other. So you could have an isopropyl clashing with a hydrogen or an isopropyl clashing with a methyl. The isopropyl clashing with a hydrogen is less steric interaction. So this would be the favored one. And that's, that's the only way we need to approach it when it comes to having two possible hydrogens. Sure, there's only, sure. yes. Are you supposed to be screen sharing right now? Yep. Um, so here's the, the isopropyl that I was referring to, isopropyl clashing with a hydrogen over here is a less steric hindrance than an isopropyl running into a methyl. So the right hand, if we were ranking these in terms of how likely all four of these isomers were, instead of just picking the major products, we wanted to say major, second major, like if we wanted to go most common, second, third, fourth, the most common would be the, the most substituted. So this product here, and then these two are both tri-substituted alkenes. So they're gonna be close to the same level of stability. If we're picking one to be more common, it's gonna be the one with less steric interactions. So this one would be two this would be three. And then over here, we're making a di substituted alkene, which is less stable than the other, the other three options. All right, so the only time you absolutely need to draw it out like this is, is if you have both of those criteria satisfied. There's only one hydrogen to remove and you could have an E or a Z because then you need to arrange it like this and see which one you're gonna get. Cause it's not always going to be the one that's where the sterics are, um, are avoided because it has to be that 180 degrees. Okay. So maybe, maybe, um, maybe giving us like an example problem or something would be beneficial in the future, um, just to, for practice. Yeah, let's do one right one. now. This is let's one? do this. Yeah, let's do the okay. same problem, except we'll do. Um, let me clear all the ink off here. And actually, I'll just draw it on the board. We'll just go through it on the board. Oh. We'll do the same reaction, except I'll add a carbon on the left hand side. So it'll be a hexane hexane instead. 
six, and we'll put the carbon on carbon three and So your beta carbons are all going to be the same, basically, right? Beta carbon there, beta carbon on the methyl, beta carbon over here, except it's not an isopropyl anymore. Now we have two things that when we do a, our elimination here, we're going to be able to tell the difference, E versus Z. And so that's going to tell us we need to pay attention to this one. The, the products for these others are going to look pretty much the same, just with an extra carbon on them, right? I'm going to get, zoom in on the board a little bit so I can write small and fit all this in there with my mouse go. So if we do the illumination here, we're going to get a We're going to get that product and then the stereoisomer. So that would be this beta carbon going through the elimination would give us these two products. And we're going to favor the bottom here just because of the sterics. If it eliminates from this methyl group, we get that product. No E or Z necessary because we have two identical substituents here. And you guys see how it's the exact same reaction and the same, you know, even with three different beta carbons, still our products are going to look really similar. And so a big chunk of OCHEM is recognizing, okay, this elimination is always going to do the same thing. I just need to look at what's around it that could be the other end of the alkene. So the only part that's going to be that we really want to worry about here is here, because we only have one hydrogen we can remove. And when we do that, we're going to get two different stereoisomers. Right, so that's going to look like, so if I draw the active site now and try and show, and actually I need to be even more specific here because that's a stereo center now too, right? Because a methyl group, an ethyl group, and then all of this and a hydrogen, we had four things attached to it. So I didn't need to show the stereochemistry before because, because we wound up with a product where we had two methyls attached here that were identical. So now I need to be careful with the symmetry. So if I draw this active site out, I'm gonna, there's our two carbons. I'm gonna draw the bromine going down, which means I had the, then up and going into the board would be the methyl group. And up and coming out of the board would be the ethyl group. I'm just taking these three and I'm rotating them like 60 degrees so that the bromine, so that instead of having the bromine out, I'm putting the bromine flat, which rotates the other two so they're pointed up. And that puts the ethyl group that was in the plane of the board is now coming out towards us. The methyl group that was into the board and down is now into the board and up. Can you guys see that a little bit? I'm just adjusting it a little bit so that I can draw this bromine as being flat. And on the other side, I'm going to have to do something similar so we can practice this. We want the hydrogen, which is drawn, which is into the board here, needs to be flat so that it can be in the same plane as the bromine and it needs to be pointed in the opposite direction as the bromine. 
So the hydrogen was into the board. The hydrogen was my, my middle finger here. I want it to be flat in the board. So I'm going to do that. Rotate everything a little bit. That puts the hydrogen up and in the plane. That's going to put the the methyl is now going to be going down and out towards us. And the ethyl So what that's going to, to do is now we're locked into this configuration. Um, and so now it doesn't matter about the stereotypes because this is the way it has to be for the reaction to happen. So now when everything reacts, these electrons move over, bromine leaves with its electrons, our base grabs the hydrogen. We're going to wind up with the we're going to wind up with the two ethyl groups trans relative to each other and the two methyl groups trans relative to each other. So we'll get a product that's going to look like And Sean, does that happen with every single reaction or is there like tells with specific ones that's supposed to flip like that? So it happens every single reaction. The, okay. the reason we don't need to do this every single time is it only makes a difference as to which product we get if there's only one hydrogen that can be removed from that alpha carbon. And if we can tell the difference between the two products, if there are two possible stereoisomers, right? If, if you, if both of those things are not true, if you can't say yes to both of those questions, then you don't need to draw it out like this because, because there's enough possibilities, there's enough different ways things can rotate and enough hydrogens that can be removed that you don't need to worry about it. So it's- So we need to worry about that if it's a single hydrogen and what was the other one? If the, if the beta carbon only has one hydrogen and there are two possible stereoisomers. Okay. So for the example on the quiz, we didn't need to draw it out like this because we wound up with two methyls on our product, right? Which meant we, there was no E and Z because you had two identical things attached. Right. And if we started with the opposite stereoisomer, then we would get the product that was opposite. even though, so it's not just that this is an ethyl and that's an ethyl and they're both big, so they push each other away. It's because we started with this stereoisomer. If I flipped these, if we put the hydrogen coming out towards us and the methyl group going away from us, then we'd wind up with these being switched because when we rotate our hydrogen to be flat, we're rotating the opposite direction, which would put our methyl group back and our ethyl group forward. And now when we do this mechanism and we flatten it out, we wind up with both of our methyl groups are pointed out of the board towards us. So even though that's the less sterically favored position, we would get the, the, the product that looked like that, right? So you will only get one product if those two conditions are true. If you only have one hydrogen, actually I can simplify further. If you only have one hydrogen on that beta carbon, you will only get one product from that beta carbon. But if you can't tell E versus Z, then it doesn't really matter. You can tell E versus Z, then you got to do this for for a hundred percent full credit. Right, and just to be clear, you're it, it's going to be pretty obvious when we need to do that because you'll be ha you'll have the the high or the the group like this methyl group, for instance, you drew as a wedge or coming going away from us. 
dashed, whatever. Um, I think so, yeah. I think that in order to have the alpha, yeah, that's a good, another good one, Adam. The alpha and the beta carbon will both be chiral. Wow. Well, yeah, I was just, what I was worried about no. is like missing it. The, the beta carbon will have to be chiral for this to be the case. The alpha carbons not necessarily have to be chiral. If that's the case, then couldn't you just rotate it and it doesn't matter then? I'm trying because to think. Chiral, then, and that's the whole point. Like you, as you rotate it, it changes. Uh, you, I thought, you, I mean, may, you may be right. I'm just trying to double check. Right, my yeah. Head. No absolutes. Right. Um, if the alpha carbon is not chiral, then you have two things that are attached to the alpha carbon that are the same, which means you won't get E or Z. Um, it'll be the alpha carbon where you have the two identical substituents attached then. So you're right. Both of them have to be chiral for this to be the case. Okay, so that's a pretty specific set of circumstances that should be your, your red flag. Um, if both the alpha and the beta carbon are chiral, then you have to do this. Hey, Sean, do, um, do carbons spin in the same direction? Like the, or would it, is, are they counterclockwise? Does there, it, if it's all sigma there? bonds and there, there are no rings or anything, then they're spinning in whatever direction they want. That's kind of just like, if you think about having, having two, two wheels on an axle with nothing attached to the axle, the two wheels can spin either direction, right? They're not linked or they're not locked into only spinning one direction. Right. I just wasn't sure if like sterics, because say like one is spinning, if it's, will it force the other one to kind of keep going in a way or like so and, it out pass it since, you know, the eclipse formation. So if you do that, then what you wind up having is not, you don't wind up with them. If you wind up with them both rotating in the same direction, then that's not really necessarily going to give you a different conformer. You're just going to wind up, wind up with the entire molecule flipping if that's the case, right? Yeah, that's why I kind of, I was asking. So some, you only wind up with a different conformer if either one carbon is still relative to the other and, the, and one is rotating, or if they're rotating in opposite directions, that will give you a different conformer. Otherwise you're just flipping the entire molecule as it's spinning. But all of this is happening all at the same time. Um, Probably a matter of relativity, I suppose. Um, relativity and just in the statistical mechanics that, you know, there are so many possible ways for these things to be rotating and they're doing all of them at the same time. Hmm. Um, I, there's a, a famous organic chemist um, named uh, Hoffman. Actually, it's not the same Hoffman as the Hoffman product. It's a different Hoffman um, who actually wrote a book of poetry. Um, he, he wanted to be like, you know, just uh, a Renaissance man. So he wrote a book of poetry. Uh, he had a way with words. Yeah, I will give him that, although his poetry is pretty bad. Um, but he's, his famous quote is, it's a wild dance floor down there at the molecular level. Everything is spinning in every direction conceivable and rotating in every direction conceivable and twisting around and flying in all three dimensions at the same time. Um, and all of that's happening simultaneously. So it's we basically pretend like they're not moving or that half of it's not moving so we can rotate the other half because it's convenient. Um, but it's not like it's really locked into, as long as everything's all sigma bonds, everything is moving all the time. Um, so absolutely good, good question. And, and good observation, the alpha and the beta carbon have to be chiral, and that meets both of our criteria, right? If the alpha and beta carbon are both chiral, then one, there's only going to be one hydrogen on the beta carbon, and you wind up needing to be, to tell the difference between E and Z, right? So that's your, your best way to flag this. Uh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm such a space cadet. 
by chiral, you just mean that they have to be rotating? I... Sorry, uh, no, chiral, by chiral, I mean that they have to have four different things attached to the carbon. Okay. In, in asymmetric center. In our okay. Business. Okay, yeah, vocabulary isn't my forte. It's, it doesn't help that there are more than one vocab terms that we use for, for the same thing here. Um, depending on whether you're a physical organic chemist or if you're a synthetic organic chemist or if you're a biochemist, you use different words to describe the same thing. Um, so so I, and I switch back and forth between them. Um, and I've noticed that one year versus the next, I tend to favor, I'll favor one vocab way to describe it in one year. And then the next year, depending on the class and how I taught it, I'll favor the, the another one. Um, so that can get confusing too for you guys. All right. Let's let's do this one, and then we'll take our break, and then we'll come back and we'll get into to new material. All right, so one of most of you guys figured out that hydroxide in water and goes through a substitution reaction in water is pretty much always going to favor SN1. Page one. Sorry, sharing screen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if we are, anytime you see in water, it's almost always going to go SN1. Because water stabilizes your nucleophiles and also stables the carbocation intermediate that you get. And so you're almost always going to see the SN, if it's in water, it's going to be SN1. Or if it's in a protic solvent in general, it's usually going to be SN1 unless you're specifically told otherwise. Well, there are some other criteria that we'll go over after break, um, which means our carbocation intermediate would look like this, and the stereochemistry winds up not mattering at this point, because once it's a carbocation, it flattens out and becomes planar. So it doesn't matter whether it was R or S to begin with, if it's going through SN1. Um, and most of you guys also caught that it being in the allylic position means that there's resonance, right? So the others, carbocation would be a positive charge here. Would look like something like this, which is sloppy. Um, basically, I move the positive charge over here, move the double bond over. So our resonance structure would be, or our arrows to draw the resonance structure would look like that. So those are our two possibilities, and they're both going to give us different products if we, and actually let me, let me make room on the slide here and tidy this up a bit. So we have There was our first resonance structure and the second one. It's going to look like that. The first resonance structure, if we then have hydroxide acting as our nucleophile, then we're going to get Everything stays right where it is. We'll get this product, which most of you guys got. But what you didn't recognize is that that's still a chiral carbon. That's still an asymmetric center. There's more than one, or there's four different things attached to that carbon. And since it went through that planar intermediate, the hydroxide could attack from up top or on bottom equally. 
which means you're going to get R and S. For, so for full credit, you needed to say both of them or draw both versions. And then similar problem on the bottom one, except it's not R versus S that we get as a product because we have two, two identical methyl groups attached. We're going to get E and Z both. So we'll get a product that looks like this, that's not an asymmetric carbon, not a chiral carbon because you have two identical methyls, but our alkene now has a stereoisomer. So this would be the E stereoisomer. There would also be the Z stereoisomer formed. So again, most of you guys got the right products, you just missed the stereochemistry, which means you did most of it right. And this is, like I said, this is one of the trickiest things is predicting, looking at a possible structure and say, okay, is there another stereoisomer that's equivalent that I would also make? John, so do you there have were, a rearrangement too? Um, you wouldn't have the rearrangement because you have the resonance instead. Because the you you get a um, secondary carbocation resonating with a tertiary carbocation. The tertiary carbocation is not going to rearrange because it's already as stable as it can be. The secondary carbocation is also not going to rearrange because if you move a hydrogen over from from over here, you lose your resonance. And you're not gonna really move a hydrogen over from the other one because I would still be making it a secondary carbocation. And in fact, a secondary carbocation on the same carbon as a, an alkene was even less stable than if it was just secondary. So you, it won't rearrange because you have the resonance instead. I was thinking um, the methyl shift to make that carbocation tertiary. So you would need to move your methyl two whole carbons to do that. And so you won't see it move that far. You would have to shift the methyl over here and then shift it another carbon. So how about would... from the right side? Um, you will only see Let's see, if you move the methyl over, met, the methyl shifts only happen if there's not a hydrogen next door that could, that could move instead. You only typically see methyl shifts if it's a quaternary carbon next to a charge. Um, so, because, but in theory, yes, you, it seems like you could be able to, but because the methyls are so much bigger, they move slower, which means it's, and it's going to wind up reacting before that could actually happen. There might be some trace amount of product that looks like the methyl shift, but it'd be such a small amount that we wouldn't necessarily draw it. So basically the methyl okay. shift would be your last resort. That, and that's a good point. You only see the methyl shift if it's a quaternary carbon next to a, a secondary carbocation. Sean, wouldn't that make that a primary? I'm oh, sorry, sorry, John. Oh, no. Oh, and actually, well, yeah, you're, you're right, Adam. Um, yeah, it did okay. shift the methyl over, the charge shifts the other way too. So we'd actually be making a primary carbocation because we're not shifting just the methyl, we're bringing the electrons with it, which means the positive charge would be where we move the methyl from which would make it primary. So the, my house gets really noisy when it's really windy and I didn't sleep so well last night. It shows. All right, um, last question and then we'll take our break. Um, if an allylic carbon goes through an elimination reaction, does it form a diene? So this is our 
first off, any questions on on these products? Does everybody see, see, oh, I just needed to put ENZ or I need to put R and S. I actually do have some questions, but we can maybe hold it for lab or if you want to address we'll it. We'll talk about it in about, break in a, in a minute. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did um, like this, go ahead. John, just to clarify, so like on tests, there's, um, we can just write RS to get full, see full points or are you gonna want us to write out both structures? No, that's fine, uh, especially on a test where you have time Okay. time constraints um especially if you know that r to switch r versus s if you drew the wedge on the oxygen um initially and then to get the an enantiomer you would just do the dashes on the oxygen it would give you the other enantiomer um especially once you're comfortable with that i don't mind if you draw it as being flat and say it's going to be both versions of it you'll get the r and the s what I'm really looking for is, did you recognize that you made something that had a chiral carbon? As long as you recognize and, and can show me what both of the products would look like. Um, and so drawing it as a skeletal structure and then saying R plus S is good enough for me. Okay, so every time we create a chiral center within one of the atoms, like a, a nucleophilic attack, then we add in the R and S. Because you want us to- unless you're, only, unless you're only gonna get one of the stereoisomers. If it's SN2, where it goes through that umbrella flip, then you're not going to get R and S. You would only get one of the stereoisomers. So what you're showing me by saying R and S is that you're recognizing that you're going to get both of them versus a reaction where you only get R or only get S. And again, we'll go through practice. the rest of today's class is practice. How do I know if it's SN1 versus SN2? Because that's SN1, if you make a, a chiral carbon, you're always going to get R plus S. If it's SN2, and you started with a specific stereoisomer, you will only get one of the enantiomers as your product. So knowing SN1 versus SN2 is going to allow you, tell you if you need to write R plus S or if you need to draw one of them specifically. All right, last question. Quiz questions, if an allylic carbon goes through an elimination reaction, does it form a diene? So allylic, again, means adjacent to a pi bond. So this is the, an allylic carbon. If it goes through an elimination reaction, we're not going to go through an elimination reaction. We're not going to take that hydrogen off. That is a beta carbon, but that would make a product then would look like this. We wind up with a carbon with two pi bonds in the middle, which can't have any resonance, right? Because those two pi bonds have to be perpendicular to each other. So if you go through an elimination reaction on an allylic carbon, it's always going to be the other beta carbon that loses its hydrogen. Um, and our result will be what's called a conjugated diene, where your two double bonds can resonate with each other. So we would get something like that. And then the enantiomer would be the Z version. if it went through a elimination reaction, we would in fact make that diene and that actually limits which, alpha, which beta carbons we'll use. Did I count carbons wrong? One was six. I think it's right. Four, five, six, yeah. Um, and those conjugated dienes actually will we'll spend a, a whole chapter on conjugated dienes next quarter um, because that actually has a whole, they, they react really interestingly because they have resonance, but not as much as benzene. So they can react more than benzene can um, and can actually do interesting things like make ring structures. They call it a cycloaddition um, when you can actually, you actually wind up with 
um, a conjugated diene reacting with something else to make a whole new molecule. You basically stick two things together, like clicking a seatbelt together. Um, but anyway, that's next quarter. Let's take a break. It's been a long hour and six minutes. Um, so let's come back at quarter after and we'll, we'll keep working on this. I'm sorry, Adam, did you have some more questions too? We can, if you're still there. Oh yeah, but I mean, I know you need a break, man. <laughs> it's all good. Um, if we can do it, I mean, if it's a well, it's, it's reaction, okay. I'll stay on. But. No, I mean, it's basically just the um, mechanics of what that, the SN1 or S versus SN2. So because it's polar, I, I figured it would do both because the SN2 is still going to be faster, I figured, but obviously the major product would be the the SN1 or does does SN2 just not happen at all? It'll it'll happen a small amount, um, but it's not going to affect what the major product is, and it's not going to add another product because that's really that's going to give you the same product that we had already drawn. It's mm -hmm, just going to favor just... the the specific stereoisomer a little bit. So instead of being a 50-50 R plus S, maybe it would really be 55% right. of it would be the the S and the other 10% or in the and 45 would be R. Um, mm -hmm. And but since that wasn't the major product anyway, the major product um, for the SN1 would have been the, the resonance structure that put the positive charge on the tertiary carbon. Um, mm -hmm. That would be you're, you're going to because it's in water, it's going to favor the SN1. It's not to say the other one doesn't happen, though. You're, you're absolutely right. OK, yeah. Um... Well, I guess more, I think that kind of answered my question. I feel like there's something else complicated, but then I guess, so if, then for, if it's SN1, number one, I didn't know resonance happens as a intermittent or intermediary or whatever. So we can get E and Z from resonance uh, remo uh, removal. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't know that. That's one thing. And then, um, yeah, I think that was, oh, and then I guess. So you, then would you get a mixture of, no, I guess that is the answer. Okay. So then you would get a mixture of all, all of them. Right. And, and the other reason right. why it doesn't, it doesn't wind up being a close enough. You do have SN1 and SN2 happening, but they don't wind up being, it's not so like different. one, like that one's twice as fast as the other. Usually if you're favoring one mechanism over the other, it's, it's, we're favoring it like 99 to 1% instead of, like 90 to 10 even like there's so right. we're, when we say favoring a mechanism there's that exponential term in those rate constants mm. um and that exponential term means that a tiny difference in the in the activation energy is can be a factor of 10 difference as far as the rates so we regularly will see things go we can say both reactions happen but 99.9 percent .9 of the time it goes one way versus the other so you wouldn't be wrong to say that they're both happening, but usually if we say it's favoring one mechanism, we just leave the other one out of it, unless I specifically say draw everything and then pick your mechanism. Right, and like label it. Um, okay, I think I think I kind of got it. And then my next question was kind of with the resonance, but I think we'll probably get more into that with the, the dying uh, section, like you were saying. Cause yeah, I wasn't sure if it, like we had rearrangement, would you get a mixture of all of them? Cause like there's the intermittent stage where the resonance is kind of moving around. Um, what, so, yeah, so I think the, we'll get there though. Like say there was more than one, it was already a dying. Like, would you get a mixture of everything kind of moving around? Cause like one, one uh, pi bond could move to the carbocation, but, and then something could move in there. And then the other one can move as well. So you're going to get a mixture of like all, all two or three, right? Yeah. So if we had, if this was our, our starting compound instead, and we've had the bromine over here, mm -hmm. there's going to be three different, three right. different um, resonance structures, right? There's the primary resonance structure, there's the secondary resonance structure, and then there's the tertiary resonance structure. 
-hmm. and still favor the tertiary resonance structure um, because all of it's kind of everywhere that charges everywhere at once you end up with a partial charge at each of those carbons right um and so it and you wouldn't if you have resonance I, and i think i can say this if you have resonance you're not going to do a rearrangement because the resonance is usually more significant than a rearrangement like, um, like a methyl or uh hydride shift right you're not going to see that yeah, okay and so moving electrons in resonance we consider that yes. different than a rearrangement we'll move a sigma bond i'd figure they're the smallest thing so that would probably be the fastest exactly exactly yeah. and it and it winds up you still wind up being able to spread out and if you do a rearrangement you're going to lose that resonance and so that resonance winds up being more important both it's both faster and more significant because you you would be going uphill in energy to do a rearrangement even if it does move that primary carbocation to a secondary that's not as fast or as effective as resonating that charge okay so um so if it was just a straight and an allylic uh what was it propane so it was just okay. to say it was just a single or a, a single bond and a double bond yeah and, and that was yeah so would that just not go through elimination then because you said the hydrogen won't get pulled off of the the uh secondary yeah. carbon there's probably a way to do it but it's going to be pretty unstable you're 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 almost never going to see that a dying i can't remember there's a specific term for this um you're almost never going to see this okay um i can't think of what they call that it's not an isolated dying it's isolated conjugated and something um but it's they're very very rare right okay because yeah in the book it says that um like phenols and allylics happen basically only during like SN1 and SN2 and it's very rare, but, and then that's why I was like, well, what would happen if that happened? And that's kind of where that question right. came from. Right, but you, you do say like, carb, like carbon dioxide has that structure, right? Um, but carbon oxygen bonds are so stable um, that that winds up being acceptable. I'm trying to think, so dying classes. Cumulated dienes. Okay. Cumulated diene is is the one where they you have both double bonds on the same carbon, um, and they're like I said, pretty rare. Right. I mean, I yeah. Is it because of the rigidity or like just like the um the orbitals? Like it's unlikely. It's unlikely. Sp sp. Just sp carbons are less stable than sp two carbons in general because your you know pi bonds are not as stable as sigma bonds, and the fact that you're forcing two double bonds to be on the same carbon means you're forcing a lot of electron density onto one carbon, even if it is perpendicular to the to each other. There's still a lot of electrons there, and electrons um, push comes to shove. Electrons repel other electrons. So there are a couple different reasons. One, that you know, two pi bonds on the same carbon is less stable, and just for various reasons, be it just the Coulombic repulsion and um, the hybridization, more sigma right. bonds is better. Cool. All right. Thanks. And one last question, is quick. Um, so the I even looked this up online. It seems like there's a dispute between Klein thinks that terp butoxide is a strong base, strong uh, nucleophile and everywhere else seems to not um so i was just curious what your opinion on would be because i feel like we use that a lot um, um the strong so tert butoxide is it's a strong base it's not a strong nucleophile yeah klein has it as a strong nucleophile when you use it on primary and secondaries like I would, a problem I would not, I on would, primary and they, they I would not consider it that just because of the sterics. Most of yeah. the alk oxides will be a strong nucleophile and a strong base, but because of the sterics, I would not consider that to be. So yeah, that's that's what I figured, but that's I mean, that's why the being on like a primary carbon kind of makes sense. Like, yeah, that would if anything, that's where it would happen, but I just right. wasn't sure if you know. 
but your That's, opinion, I guess, if I did that, or I, I mean, I doubt, I don't know if we'll see that on test, but just in case. Um, and I'm, if, um, yeah, if we look at the list of strong nucleophiles, if it's on there in the textbook, as long as you understand that it's not going to be as strong as the others, then that's um, and that's okay. Where is um, and actually, and this is good for everybody now that we're ten minutes later. And um, if you look at the end of the chapter, there's good review sections usually, and I think that there's a list of yeah, right here, this section here. Strong base, yeah, strong true. nucleophile. It's not on there. It's not on there in this in the summary. Mm -hmm. They might have said it somewhere else. Like in the that's why. I, yeah, I think there's an. Ex that's why I went through it last night, and there's an example of it, or two nights ago, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's not specifically stated, but he just uses it for, as an example, and um, yeah. And that's, I guess, what you're supposed to take as. And from then on, like, even when you look in the back or like, I was, there's a, a practice problem and the explanation calls it a strong base, strong nuke. Okay. So I, I, I don't, I, those are the only two places I've found it so far, but. Yeah, I'll check the, um, yeah. that, and I'll, part of the issue could be that there's usually the solutions manual with, um, of a textbook. And this is good advice in general. Um, the solutions manual for a college textbook is usually not written by the same person who wrote the textbook itself. Usually it's a grad student who's being paid um, to just go through and do every practice problem in the whole book. Um, and they're overworked and underpaid. And so, and they don't necessarily think exactly like their advisor does. And so sometimes the solutions manual might, one might have errors in it and two might not agree a hundred percent with the explanation in the textbook because it's got you know two different points of view um so if you do wind up with something that disagrees between those usually it's safer bet is to go with the the description in the textbook rather than the solutions manual um if you find a point blank disagreement like that um and i'll so I'll, I'll look through there too and see if i can find it if you find the specific practice problem let me know um yeah double check it well, I know the specific practice problem actually. Okay, what is it? Which one is it? It's I think it's pentane iodo or it's one iodo pentane I think. And oh, it's butane. My bad. It's a uh, butane, not. Uh, so it's not going to affect the, I, I mean, it no, it's the same thing. What, yeah. what number, you know what number it was. So I just, oh, um, so I just find what the, yeah, it's, uh, it's at the end. It's when we're telling the difference. One second. It is 737, 7.37 uh, E. 7.37. There. All right. Yeah, so. Yeah, for most reagents in this category. So there, the solutions manual is technically correct in that it says tert-butoxide is a strong nucleophile and a strong base. Um, and then it says, but because of the steric hindrance of tert-butoxide, um, it will it will favor the E2 instead. And so and it's it's right. That is a strong base. All of the alkoxides are strong bases, but because of the steric hindrance, it acts like a weak base or as a weak nucleophile. Um, because it can't really get to that active carbon unless it's a primary carbon, but it still is going to favor 
tert butoxide is still always going to favor the elimination over right, the substitution okay. because of that steric hindrance. So it's that it's you it's basically it's it's a splitting hairs distinction. You're going to favor the elimination with tert butoxide if it's primary. You might favor it, you know, five to one instead of ten to one over the mm. substitution. Um, but you're still right. going to favor the elimination. Okay. And that's why for the other for the other resources, and for those of you guys coming back, go ahead and um, start talking about these. What I lost my there it is. Um, I posted this link the other day, and that's why for in most resources, it'll, you'll just see tert butoxide listed as strong based weak nucleophile, just because it's going to favor elimination over anything else. Um, it's technically is still a strong nucleophile. It just can't get to the carbon. Um, so two ways of saying the same thing, basically. Yeah. Sterics really matter then. Okay. Exactly. With, uh, with T butyl groups, especially, um, sterics really matter. Yeah, and I mean, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, so we're get we're just getting ahead of of uh, ourselves here. Let's talk about the rest of this first. There's some more practice yeah. here, um, with uh, trying to figure out if you're going to get more than one product or not. So, B here is another practice problem where we have two chiral carbons next to each other. We have our alpha and our beta are both chiral. Um. So this is another practice problem like we did earlier. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this since we've already we already did um, a bunch of practice with this. Um, but we can go through that on um, on Thursday for more practice at the beginning of class for a little bit of review. Um, and if we want to know what are the relative reactivity of, of alkyl halides in an E2 reaction. Relative reactivity just means what's going to react faster. And it's generally going to be for an E2 reaction, for an elimination reaction, it's going to be very similar to reactivities for the substitution reactions. If it's E2, you need to have access to that carbon over here in, it, um, in order for the base to come in here. So if your beta carbon is less sterically hindered and if you have a good leaving group that's going to favor that reaction happening faster um there's a a table in a different textbook i used to teach that that went through and listed all the possibilities for the alkyl halides um, methyl and primary go sn2 only vanillic meaning if you have a halide that's attached directly to a double bond. So if we had this molecule, this is what's called the vanillic position. So allylic means adjacent to a pi bond. Vanillic means attached to a carbon that's in a pi bond. Um, so the and that's that's the word vinyl with IC on the end, turning vinyl into an adjective by saying vanillic. Um, and so the those are pretty unreactive. Um, vinyl carbons don't typically participate in reactions um, in S in elimination or substitution reactions. Um, so we're not going to we're basically not going to worry about them for now and aerial halides aerial means is, is the same thing as saying on a benzene ring so basically if you've got a, a halogen attached to a carbon that's already in a pi bond you're not going to see elimination or substitution that's a whole you get a whole different class of reactions then um so we're not we're not touching that yet secondary alkyl halides sn1 and sn2 they're benzylic or allylic, meaning that you can get resonant structures. You get SN1 and SN2. Um, tertiary, you go SN1 only. This, this has got a lot of information here on this table. 
but it's not that easy to process it. Um, and so I, I have found there's a few other sources that have more, more organized um, information. Um, we can see things like what are the similarities between first order reactions, meaning E1 and SN1 are only gonna happen if it's secondary or tertiary. The SN2 and E2 will only happen if it's primary or secondary. So primary versus tertiary, that actually allows us right there to say it's gonna go first order versus second order. Meaning concerted would be the SN2, would be the second order where you have to have everything happening at once. Um, and if it's, we only need to worry about splitting the hairs with both first order and second order happening, if it's secondary. If it's secondary, we have to dig in a little deeper to tell what's favored, or if both of them are happening approximately at the same rate. Um, the, the textbook has a graphic I think is pretty helpful. And actually, now that I have this widescreen here, I can grab the entire section. Man, it's windy out today. You guys see we're supposed to get, I think we're supposed to get something like a, an inch of rain tonight, at least in the, in the basin. And I lost my other link. There we go. Um, basically this, this chart in the middle has a ton of information in it. Um, and it's color coded and makes it easier to look at um, and arranged as a table. The, the axis on the left is talking about where is your alkyl halide? Is it primary, secondary, tertiary? The axis along the top is talking about what is your nucleophile? Because remember, almost all nucleophiles are also bases. So it's just a matter of how good of a base is it relative to how good of a nucleophile is it that determines elimination versus substitution, right? So if it's a strong base and a weak nucleophile, doesn't matter if it's primary, secondary, or tertiary, it's always gonna go E2. You don't have a good nucleophile, you're not gonna see substitution, except in very rare cases. If it's a strong base, strong nucleophile, then we're gonna still favor second order reaction unless we're in a protic solvent. And the, the differentiation between elimination versus substitution has to do with is it primary or secondary. If it's primary, you're gonna favor substitution because your nucleophile can get in there and actually attack the active carbon. If it's secondary, and you have a strong base that's also a strong nucleophile, it can get in there and do the substitution, but there's also a pretty good chance that it's just gonna grab a hydrogen from a beta carbon instead, just because of the, the space, just because of the sterics. If it's a weak base and a strong nucleophile, you don't see any elimination. Um, you'll only see, um, SN2 for a primary carbon, SN1 for a tertiary carbon, and SN2, this is for if it's in a aprotic solvent. If it's in a protic solvent, this flips to SN1. So this still is a little bit oversimplified. So it looks good, has a lot of information here, including a list of common um, nucleophiles and bases. Strong base, weak nucleophile will only go through elimination. Strong base, strong nucleophile, we're in that competitive range. Weak base, strong nucleophile will only go through substitution. Weak base, weak nucleophile doesn't react much at all. And when it does, it has to be a favorable leaving group where you're making a really stable intermediate and it's gonna go that first order reaction. 
right? So if it's a weak base and a weak nucleophile, it's gonna go through a carbocation intermediate. Means, so SN1 or E1. And you're gonna get a mixture of both of them. Right, and so that was what that problem was. Hydroxide in water, it's in water, which means, but it's still got hydroxide. So hydroxide is a strong base, strong nucleophile, but it's in water. And in water is gonna favor going through the first order reaction, or sorry, yeah, first order reactions, even if you do have a strong base in there as well. Um, and plus I, I called it out as saying it goes through substitution because I was specifically wanted you guys to look at the resonance structures. So sometimes I will, if I don't just say point blank, what's the product? If I give you more information, like it goes through a substitution or I tell you what the mechanism is, then ignore all this and just say, okay, Sean's telling me it's, he wants me to look at this mechanism. Don't worry about the other variables for right now. If I don't specify, if I just say, what's the major product? We got to figure out what mechanism it's going to go through. Right. And this cheat sheet here that I put out the other day um, has more information to it um, in that it has some descriptions, not color coded, so it's not as pretty but it has more information here. And it's arranged kind of in a similar way where you've got your substrate on the left and said, instead of what are, what's the class of the rea reactants, it says, what's, what is the different mechanism? So never for SN1, if it's primary, it will never be SN1 or E1. SN2 is highly favored with a strong nucleophile. If you have a bulky base or a strong base plus heat, is the other piece here that we'll see. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then we have these other categories. If it's secondary or if it's resonance stabilized, then we can have all four mechanisms could happen at once. And then it's a matter of looking at the, at the um, details to say, uh, are we at low temperatures or high temperatures? Do we have a strong base or strong nucleophile? Um, are, and what's our solvent? So that the only thing that this one does not get into is looking for at solvent. And remember, protic solvents favor first order reactions. So we could add a second category here. Let me open this in my other viewer. Um, so we will favor these first order reactions are going to be more strongly favored if we're in a protic solvent. So that is one more that that's sort of a tiebreaker. If it's secondary, benzylic or allylic, and you're not sure if it's going to go SN, if it's going to go SN1 or SN2, look at what the solvent is. If the solvent is protic, meaning it has a an acidic proton it can give up, it has an oxygen-hydrogen bond, is normally the thing you're looking for. Um, then you're going to favor the first order reactions. because those protic solvents stabilize your reactants more. If you stabilize your reactants, you're gonna slow down the concerted reaction because your nucleophile is not as strong as it could be, or your base is not as strong as it could be. All right, so really two different ways of looking at the same variables. Um, and this, this chart does also have a good list of strong, strong nucleophile weak base, strong base weak nucleophile. It's a little bit more comprehensive. There are more options here than on the, the one from Klein. I'm usually gonna pick one of the um, more common examples. I think the only one that I, would, that I would normally pick from that's not on here is the TBOK. 
That's our sterically hindered um, strong base weak nucleophile. So put that one under this category here. And probably the reason it's not in there is because the same thing that Adam and I were talking about when you guys were coming back, it's, it is technically a strong nucleophile, but because it's sterically hindered, um, it's not going to actually get in there and attack that active carbon. It'll instead favor an elimination reaction. Sean, is uh, DBN and DBU considered bulky or no? Yes, that's the same. same. So it's dibutyl, dibutyl amine, I think. And it's like it, nano or uh, nona in an under okay. Yeah. Or under um, in. They are, they're in that category of sterically hindered and they might even be, I think that's di yeah, it's like a diisopropyl amide. Dibutyl amide is going to look something like this as well. Um, and they're, they're all, they are specifically, if you go back to the section in the textbook that has that. So it's from 737. So that was back in this section. There's DBN, DBU. Um, so they are big bulky groups as well. And a lot of time, there are other big bulky groups that we see as well that are also alkoxides. Um, TBUOK is the most common. I'm trying to think of. There are the other two. There's, there's TBU. Oh, there's tert butoxide. This would be tert. I don't even know what you call this. I'd have to look up what that name was, but it's basically if you have an oxygen with a negative charge, it's going to be a good base. And the bigger the things are that are attached to it, the more it's going to favor elimination instead of substitution. And you're going to favor the Hoffman product instead of the Zaitsev product as well. All right. So my favorite way to approach this is to basically say, okay, let's practice doing all the mechanisms first. And then we'll say, and then we'll look at this system and say, okay, which one of these mechanisms is going to be favored? So it can be helpful to sort of arrange your paper as, okay, these are going to be my SN2 products. These are my SN1 products. These are my E2 products. This is my E1 product. Um, and then you can, because then you can go back through and say, okay, I'm only going to do this mechanism. Um, and so if I say draw all elimination and substitution products, I want for all mechanisms, regardless of which one's going to be favored. If I just say, what's the major product, then you can pick your mechanism first. Mechanism or mechanisms, plural. So if we have where I got this figure from, the sloppy lines there. Um, I probably made it myself. Um, I've gotten better at that. Well, Software has gotten better, rather. Um, if we're looking to say, OK, what are all the possibilities here? If it goes SN1 or E1, a lot of these are going to be duplicates. So if we're trying to say, okay, what are the possibilities? You pull up mole view on half of my screen. If this product or this reactant goes through SN1, First thing that's going to happen is it's going to make an intermediate that's got a positive charge on the secondary carbon here, right? And then we would wind up with this coming in and attaching. So we are going to wind up with something that looks like this. And now we just draw our base attack, or our. T-butyl group attached. I should probably should have drawn it over here, but that would have taken up more space. Yeah. 
Um, and we're also going to get the opposite stereoisomer, right? Because this was, if we say SN1, it goes through that carbocation intermediate, which means we're going to get both possibilities. So we would also get, and again, this is one of, this is a case where you, where you will also get you'll get both of these in approximately equal amounts if it goes SN1. SN2 is simpler, right? SN2 didn't go through that intermediate. You just have backside attack happening, right? So we have SN1 here and SN1 here. And SN2 will give you that product. That's our only SN2 product, right? SN2 is our simplest mechanism as far as the number of possible products because it all happens at once. And it's not an elimination where you need to worry about where could I put a pi bond. It's only going to be on the act, same active carbon, and you're just going to get the inverted shape if we think about e one this is also a fairly simple mechanism or um um fairly simple in terms of elimination because we only have two beta carbons, right? So regardless of whether it goes E1 or E2, the elimination products have to be a pi bond between the alpha carbon and a beta carbon. And then it's just a matter of, is there also, is there also a stereoisomer? And now the question becomes, so if it's E1, it's first order going through that, that um, intermediate, that carbocation intermediate, is there going to be a preference between any of these? There, E1 is going to make all of them, right? Is it with the bulky base, you get the less substituted alkene? Correct. With the big bulky base, you get the Hoffman product instead of the Zate separate. Normally, we want to make the more substituted base, but if our base is big and bulky, like a T butyl group, we're going to favor the less substituted base just because of sterics. And is E is E2 going to change? So E1 could make all of these. Can E to also make all of these? There's still beta carbons in the same spot, right? The beta carbon, the secondary beta carbon has two hydrogens, so you're going to get both of these if it's concerted. And you're still going to get this one as well. So all of these could also be E2. All right, so these are all of our possible products here. And really for E1 versus E2, we will see the biggest difference between E1 and E2 is if there can be a rearrangement because E1 will go through a rearrangement, E2 won't. And E1 also doesn't have to worry as much about um, if there's only one hydrogen adjacent, which product you're going to make because by removing the leaving group before the elimination happens, you wind up losing your stereochemistry on that, car that alpha carbon. 
So you will get both stereoisomers if it goes E1. And you can have rearrangement if possible or resonance if possible. E2 is going to have fewer products norm normally because it has to happen all at once. And if we were just looking at this, trying to decide which of these mechanisms and, or products would be the most favored, we would look at it and say, okay, well, I have this big butyl or this big T butyl group. I have a strong base that's not a great nucleophile because of the big bulkiness. And so if I go to the other, if I go to that table, what we have is a strong base weak nucleophile. Which means we're gonna favor E2 every time. So if we come back, we're not gonna get any of this, a, not a significant amount of this forming. It's going to predominantly be this product right here. Because our big, our strong base weak nucleophile that's also big and bulky favors E2 and making the less substituted product. Right, so if you can look at that at the very beginning, if I just say, what's the major product? And you look at this and right off the bat and you recognize, oh, that's T-butoxide. It only does elimination and it makes the, the less substituted alkene. And you could jump right ahead to just drawing this. You only need to draw all of these if I specifically say draw all substitution and elimination products. All right. I think that's as good a place as any to stop for the day since we are two minutes away anyway. And I will be seeing you later today as well. So in addition to that other elimination re, um, reaction that I said we'd start with on Thursday, we'll do this one as well, do the same thing, draw all the products and then pick which one's the best, which one's going to be favored um, after everything. Okay. Any, any questions before we close down lecture? No. <laughs> all right. Um, I will see you guys at lab. There will be a, a short lecture. We're going to add a new type of spectroscopy in lab today. We do NMR, which is nuclear magnetic resonance, which is also the same concepts and, and theories that they use to make MRIs. MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging, um, because when they developed it in the 50s and 60s, nuclear was a four-letter word. So they didn't call it nuclear magnetic resonance, even though that's what it is. They just call it MRI. Um, so we will go through that and do some practice with that. And then your, your lab assignment this week is basically gonna go through, I have 10 practice problems where I give you an IR and the NMR and you have to draw the structure. Yeah. Um, NMR turns, it gives us very different data than IR does. And so when you put them together, it's usually enough information. If you know molecular formula, NMR and an IR, you can usually figure out um, exactly what your structure is, or at least narrow it down to only one or two possibility, two or three possibilities. If you can't settle on one, so we will add that in today, and um, so I will see everybody at three thirty. Cool. Thanks, John. Have a good morning, everybody. Thanks, John. You too. Thanks.